If these uh, cells are traveling through um, our blood ve vessels and that sort of thing, is there not a test for us to determine if we have cancer by using cells? Well, there's. As you, you remember, when I'm, whenever I just want, I'm going to answer your question specifically, but I also want to answer a general comment: is that um, I'm, I'm trying to present to you, as we do every year, the newest thinking. So that, you know, there's always a lag between the science and the clinical applications. Uh, uh, and, and, so, and so, you know, what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm presenting to you here is not necessarily, you know, go out and do it. I'm just trying to keep you aware of really what's happening. However, there is a test, so circulating cancer cells, uh, circulating tumor cells, CTCs, um, which actually can be measured in the blood. And what it's already been, there is actually even a commercial assay where a blood test of CTCs can be done. Uh, and what, what has been found is that if you have metastatic cancer and you have CTCs, circulating tumor cells in your blood, and the drugs are working, that the, the burden of CTCs, the number of them in your blood goes down, which is what you expect. I have a strong suspicion that, those, that at least some of those circulating tumor cells are indeed um, uh, the kinds of cells that do the seeding. Uh, and therefore, we have a tremendous amount of interest in them, and, 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 our, and it's not just breast cancer. Prostate cancer is also a disease where there's a lot of interest in them as well. Um, and they may be the most important cells that we could analyze the genes of, because if they're the ones that are actually can cause cancer growth, uh, the genes in them may be the most important ones. So this is actually a very active area of, of investigation. The only place that circulating tumor cells has been of use is in monitoring response to therapy. And frankly, since we have so many other ways of monitoring response to therapy now, uh, proteins in the blood, CEA, CA15-3, CA125, we call them markers, uh, or actually watching cancer shrink, uh, either on physical exam or uh, on imaging tests, x-rays, MRIs, CAT scans, and so on, uh, is how useful that is, is, is questionable. But from an understanding of cancer point of view, it actually is very important. Over there, please. Hi. Um, I actually had two questions, if you'll let me. I, I can't um, hear your question. Hi, I actually have two questions. Um, okay. The first one is, could you talk a little bit about calcifications and okay. what percentage do generally turn into breast cancer and what do you recommend doing and, about... And what's your second question? Uh, the second one is, there seems to be all these young women now, like famous young women, who come down with breast cancer. And I'm just wondering, uh, in light of the new information about the PSA test for men and prostate cancer, is it possible at all or is it totally, uh, am I a heretic to think that they're finding things so early now that might never evolve into anything anyway? Um, Okay, you've asked great questions, and um, I always say in this interactive lecture format, it's dangerous to ask good questions because I can go on for like 45 minutes with one question, and I'm going to try to shorten it a little less than that so we have time for other questions. First of all, I, you might have come in a little late because you're standing in the back. Um, if you looked at the picture, the people here saw, show a picture of an accumulation of cells in the duct that we call ductal carcinoma in situ, and I described how when those cells that are not yet truly cancer cells but are moving in that direction die, they can attract calcium. And that's what gives you the calcium deposits on mammography. Uh, I can't give you odds because it depends on what the calcium looks like. Uh, and there are certain characteristics of the calcium that are very worrisome that you're dealing with something like DCIS. Uh, and there, there are certain kinds of calcium deposits that we know are benign. Um, and so the expert breast imager, mammographer, you know, can, can say, uh, is this a calcium collection that, that to be absolutely sure that it's not something to worry about, uh, we should get a biopsy or not. And sometimes we see calcium and we say it's very benign calcium and we don't have to do it. So the odds depend upon how the calcium looks. It varies a lot. Now this notion of, you, you raise a whole lot of questions in your second question. I think they're all good questions and they're all very important. Um, uh, breast cancer can occur as you get older and it, the odds of it occurring increase as you get older, all the way up until you're in your 80s and then it kind of levels off. Uh, but young women can get breast cancer. I've seen breast cancer in teenagers. I've seen breast cancer in uh, people that are uh, very, very rarely we see them uh, actually in children that have not yet gone through uh, menarche, uh, in fact, uh, you know, at, at a very young age. So it can happen. But it's relatively rarer. Uh, it may be increasing, all right, in the population, but it's a little hard to tell because, remember, we're getting better at diagnosing it. And by being better at diagnosing it, you're going to find it more often, and it's going to have the appearance. And if you uh, are screening young people and occasionally you get a celebrity, obviously there's going to be a lot of publicity, and that's going to blow out of proportion uh, the, uh, you know, the actual incidence, incidence of the disease. You know? I mean, many, many more people slip in the bathtub and die than get eaten by sharks. 
but people, when, you, when somebody gets eaten by a shark, you hear about it. You don't hear about the bathtub. And so, and so the press can, can distort our perception of the situation. Um, there, is a, there is a concern, however, that is occurring in younger women, and we don't really know why, um, whether it is, uh, where there are genetic factors, whether there are environmental factors, and we can't rule out environmental factors. We, we already know that there are some environmental factors that are associated with a higher incidence of breast cancer. Um, uh, most of them are associated with a higher incidence of breast cancer in, in an older people. Uh, the, the biggest one by far is hormone replacement therapy. Um, and that's, that, that, that is, you know, maybe a third of, as high as a third of breast cancers in postmenopausal women may have been in the past caused by hormone replacement therapy. It's, it's a, was a, was a terribly risky thing to do. And we know that from carefully done studies, uh, that, that reached culmination in 2002. Uh, but there may be other factors involved, uh, you know, nutritional factors. Obesity is a known risk factor, for example. And we know that obesity is a huge public health problem in this country, uh, because of what we eat. Uh, you know, we, largely we don't eat food, we eat uh, edible food-like substances um, that have been artificially created to give the appearance of food. Um, and, uh, and that's obviously not, not the situation that our bodies have evolved in, uh, in, in you know, in the natural state. Um, so that um, these are all factors that are really, really, really very relevant. There are other things that we don't really fully understand and we still really have to look. Um, you know, pollutants in the environment probably do play a factor, but we don't know specifically yet. And I just want to say, you know, so as I don't go for the whole 45 minutes on this, I'm fascinated by this topic, is I have been saying for several years, and I think, I think others have as well, is that understanding the genetic basis of cancer is going to allow us to find the environmental things that may be linked to it, rather than classical epidemiology. Classical epidemiology is you look at people with cancer, people without cancer, you see what the differences are. That has not been particularly useful to us. Um, uh, in terms of finding, finding causation. It's actually not been useful. It's hard to find anything that way because human life is so complex. But if we could look at the gene level uh, and then find chemicals that interact in a negative way with the genes, turn some on, turn some off that may be relevant here, that's where it's going to give us a handle. And so it's a very important topic of research. Thank you. Over here, please. Has any of this new understanding on the molecular level um, helped with understanding lobular carcinoma in yeah. situ, which, uh, as I understand it, in the past often had an over-treatment in terms of surgery because not much was known and oh, you feared what it might be. Yeah, that's actually to. a really good question because it relates to the PSA question, which I, which I forgot for a second because I think it's the same basic thing. Now, okay, everything I was talking about here is ductal cancer. All right. But remember what I said when I started the talk. I said that all cancers arise from the place where the duct meets the lobule. That little area where the duct meets the lobule is about 80% ductal cells and about 20% lobular cells. And the ratio of ductal to lobular cancer is in that, in that ratio. So that the same underlying processes occur. You know, I said DCIS, you can have an LCIS where now it's lobular looking cells that also can grow in that area. Lobular carcinoma site is a little different than DCIS. Uh, you know, tends to be more hormone related, for example. LCIS tends to occur in both breasts, where DCIS is usually only occurs in one breast. So there are, there are real differences. Um, the question of overtreatment, I mean, is a very complex question. You'd have to you know, take it individually, and it relates to the PSA question. Um, and that is this, is that, yes, indeed, you know, not all lobular carcinoma in situ will progress to a lobular invasive cancer. Not all DCIS will progress to a invasive ductal cancer. But if you're faced with it and you can't tell which ones will and which ones won't, you're kind of stuck in a quandary. And, you're, and, 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 and you know, there's, you're looking at it under the, under, the, under the microscope, it's come out of a patient, looking under the microscope, you say it's LCIS. Um, most of the time, it may not turn into cancer. But how do you know in that individual case it might turn into cancer? Are you better off treating and preventing the cancer or saying the odds are it won't turn into cancer and occasionally have somebody where it turns into cancer and it's very serious and life-threatening. Until we can identify the individuals who either are going to progress into invasive cancer or not, we kind of are stuck with overtreatment. And we know we're overtreating, but, um, but uh, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a quandary you find yourself in. So if somebody shoots a gun at you, the odds are they'll miss. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't duck. And, and I think that that is the, uh, and that is the quandary. So, so understanding the genes that are related are really important. Now, the PSA is a very good example. PSA is not prostate cancer-specific antigen. It's prostate-specific antigen. As men get older, their prostates tend to get bigger. Occasionally, a guy is lucky and his prostate gets smaller. Most men, their prostates get bigger. 
as the prostate gets bigger, um, it makes more prostate-specific antigen. It's just a protein, like any other protein that I showed you, that gets made. The more cells, the more protein you have. The protein spills out in the blood, and you can measure it. Um, but, but indeed, uh, prostate cancers also make prostate-specific antigen, or at least stimulate the rest of the prostate to make prostate-specific antigen. So if you have somebody with a blood test that shows that their PSA is going up, it's, most of the time, it doesn't have anything to do with cancer. But you can't tell that unless you examine the prostate. So unquestionably, we're over-treating when we, when we do operations on the prostate because of PSA. But on the other hand, um, you know, the, the alternative is not ducking when somebody's shooting a gun at you, and occasionally you're going to get hit by a bullet. Um, most, many prostate cancers grow so slowly that if you just left them alone, nothing bad will happen. Most lobular carcinomas in situ, and indeed, many breast cancers grow so slowly that if you left them alone, nothing bad would happen. But not being able to tell in the individual case you know, which, which is a bad one and which is not, you're kind of stuck. Um, you might have seen recently, um, uh, there's a couple of guys in the audience, and, you know, and, 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 and I'm, I'm addressing you, but everybody else who cares for you, most of you are sitting next to somebody who cares about you, so we'll, 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 we'll talk about this. Is most recently, there was a study that was released that showed that measuring the PSA, operating when the PSA is up and you have a diagnosis of prostate cancer, doesn't seem to improve survival. And I must tell you is that the follow-up of those studies, which is five to ten years, is much too soon to be able to see an impact of survival in the treatment of a disease as slow-growing as prostate cancer. It's important that we look at the data because it might have shown a difference. It doesn't show a difference at this point. These people have to be followed carefully and the studies have to be, have to be continued. That it's not definitive yet in my mind that PSA doesn't save lives. Some of the very early trials in mammography showed it didn't, didn't save lives either and that clearly has been, has been really challenged by the worldwide uh, experience where mammography clearly does save lives. So maybe PSA measurements don't save lives, but I think it's, the, maybe PSA measurements do not save lives, but I think it's too soon to state that with any definite, as, as a definite conclusion. Okay, I don't remember where were we, left or right? Okay. Oh, hi. Hi, Dr. Norton, it's a pleasure hi. to speak to you. As the biggest cancer hospital in the city, and I think all over, uh, do you have any doctors or study that's working on uh, Metastatic uh, breast cancer? Yeah, well, metastatic, uh, the question is metastatic breast cancer. And metastatic cancer is, metastatic breast cancer is cancer that's spread to other parts of the body, right. as I showed you some of those illustrations. That's what we, what's one of the major things that we do, is take care of patients whose cancer is spread to other parts of the body and study uh, patients whose cancer is spread to other parts of the body in terms of trying to determine the best drug therapies for them. So that, you know, it's important to, to, that, that we take care of and that we do research on patients with all stages of breast cancer from not having breast cancer, in other words, just screening and early diagnosis all the way to patients who have advanced disease. So certainly. Um, in that regard, there's been a, um, there, there, there's been a, uh, a trend in the field of, of doctors who are studying this topic of studying drugs that work against the spread or metastatic breast cancer, and then very quickly getting those drugs and using them right at the time of diagnosis of breast cancer, what we call the adjuvant situation. Cancer is, is removed, if lumpectomy, radiation, or mastectomy, no evidence of cancer elsewhere in the body. We give drugs to kill any cancer cells that might have seeded metastatic sites but may not be apparent yet. And, uh, and there's, a, there's right now a, um, a, you know, almost a reflex tendency that when we have a drug that works against metastatic disease, where we study it primarily, to move it into the adjuvant setting. I'm beginning, over, only over the last few weeks, to think that we may be moving drugs into that setting a little sooner than we should, and that we really should focus more on the metastatic setting a little bit before we move drugs back into the adjuvant setting, uh, because uh, you know, we not only do we have really a need to take care of patients whose disease is already metastatic, uh, but I think we have to learn more about the best way to use these drugs before we start to do uh, more adjuvant trials. Adjuvant trials involve thousands of patients and many, many long years of follow-up. And you know, at this rate, it'll take us centuries to really make advances. I think if I can cure metastatic disease, I know I can cure disease in the adjuvant setting. And so I'm starting to think that we should change our focus even more in the direction of metastasis research than we are doing right now. Over here, please. Good evening, Dr. Norton. Thank you Hi. so much. Could you give me or us an executive summary of the Million Women study that came out that showed moderate alcohol intake, yeah. consumption associated with uh, increased cancer? Yeah. Um, uh, right. um, 
risk. The question is about, you know, uh, alcohol increasing breast cancer risk. All right. Um, and here, there's a very clear-cut philosophical, philosophical thing to understand, or, or a methodological thing. An association is not a causation. You can find something is associated, but you can't conclude from that that there's a linkage between the things that are associated and some kind of fundamental causation. Um, we do know that women who drink alcohol have more breast cancer than women that don't drink alcohol. We do know that the more you drink, it's associated with a higher incidence of breast cancer. This does not mean that alcohol causes breast cancer. They may be doing a lot of other things that are different, all right, that may be associated with breast cancer, or that the genetic predisposition to drink may be associated with the genetic predisposition to breast cancer. You can think of a lot of possible associations that are not causations. Is this crystal clear, what I'm saying? Okay. Um, uh, you know, the association, uh, and it's actually even funnier in Yiddish than it is in English, but we won't do that. <laughs> but that the, um, uh, so, 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 so I think that, I think that, I think that, that people got really scared when they, when, they, when, they, when they saw that, and I think that it is, um, it, that it really wasn't fair. Um, uh, and even if you think there's a causation, which I don't think we've shown by, by a long shot, um, that, uh, that uh, low levels of alcohol intake, uh, you, know, you know, an occasional glass of wine, is not going to be associated with any kind of statistically significant or major, I would say, any clinically significant increase. Uh, so that, um, because we do know, by the way, that moderate alcohol intake is, again, associated with a lower incidence of heart attacks and cardiovascular disease, so it puts people in a quandary. Uh, you, you, nobody should drink to excess. It's really bad for you in a lot of different ways, all right? Bad for your esophagus and bad for your stomach and bad for your liver and, uh, you know, bad for your social relationships and so on. But that I think that I, think that, um, uh, that, that I wouldn't from that data say that alcohol is absolutely forbidden. And I think that's, that's going way beyond it. You know, it, this is, you know the, the, the story with hormone replacement therapy, I think, is, is a very good illustration of the point that I'm making. And I think we should all sort of know that. Um, um, so if you go back to, let's say, you know, the 1990s, 1980s, 1990s, uh, early 2000s, uh, that uh, if you studied women taking hormone replacement therapy in their postmenopausal years and compared them to women not taking hormone replacement therapy, the women who were taking hormone replacement therapy had stronger bones, all right, had uh, fewer heart attacks, had fewer strokes, uh, did not have a higher incidence of breast cancer, and it looked like uh, hormone replacement therapy was a wonderful thing to do, all right. Many of us were concerned for many years, at least 20 years, some of us were talking about, it doesn't really make sense because everything I know about cancer cells suggests that some of them at least depend upon estrogen, and uh, indeed, uh, you have some experiments of nature where women are born without ovaries. There are some women that are like that, and indeed, uh, their incidence of breast cancer is much lower. There's something peculiar going on here. So a randomized trial was done by the National Cancer Institute, federally financed major trial, where women were randomly assigned to hormone replacement therapy or placebo and didn't know which one they were taking, and the doctors didn't know which one they were taking. And lo and behold, in 2002, when the data was analyzed, the women taking the hormone replacement therapy had not, not only did they have more breast cancer, but they had more heart attacks. They had more strokes. They did have stronger bones, but in every other aspect, they actually did worse. Okay? And I say, how could this be? Well, it's very simple, is, is that when you just study populations, it was the healthier women that took the hormone replacement therapy. And they weren't healthy because they took the hormone replacement therapy. They took the hormone replacement therapy because they were healthy. And they actually were hurting themselves with the hormone replacement therapy, but because they started off healthier, higher socioeconomics, more likely to see doctors, they tended to do better. So there was an association that was the exact opposite of causation, if you see, in that setting. And we know this is true because when the data was released in the middle of 2002, about half the women who were taking hormone replacement therapy stopped. And in 2003, there was a drop in estrogen receptor positive postmenopausal breast cancer by 15% in one year, okay? Just by that change. There's no other way of explaining it. It wasn't no increase in mammography. Nothing else could explain the data. It was looked at extremely carefully by very, by very good statisticians. So that, and that's why I come up with the number. If, if half the women stop and, it's, and it lowers by 15%, that's why I say that maybe a third or 30% of, of, of the cancers are caused by the hormone replacement therapy. There are still people who are taking it. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I bet you there are people in this audience who are taking hormone replacement therapy. And, it is, um, uh, and, and the evidence is that it's not doing you any good. And, uh, and, and that there are 
All the things that, that hormone replacement therapy does for you, like strengthen your bones and get rid of hot flashes, we can do just as well with much safer medications and even non-medical approaches like acupuncture uh, and yoga and other things as well uh, that, that we now know. So, so indeed, that's, a, that's an illustration of, of where association can do wrong. So if we had a randomized trial of alcohol consumption, can you imagine being randomized to ha having to drink, you know, <laughs> half a bottle of wine a day and you have to do it under doctor's orders? Can you imagine that? But we may find, indeed, that, that a randomized trial gives us the opposite result of what we see from the association, you see? So that I think that that's something you have to keep in mind. Very, very important question, very important point. Over here, please. My question refers to the imaging uh, okay. from the point of view of detection as well as follow-up. Right. Um, you mentioned mammograms and MRIs. Can you comment about PAM scans and Which P scans? PM instead of PET scans? Oh, PET, P-E-T. PET, okay, but yeah, PET scans, right? Okay. With mammograms, so it's P. Yeah, um, yeah, pe yeah. The um, uh, mammography is still the best test that we have. It is not a wonderful test. Okay, it's about eighty-five percent accurate, uh, which is good enough that it's actually hard to find something better, but it's still not a hundred percent or close to it, which is really what we want. What mammography is really good for is finding those calcium flecks that we mentioned really earlier. Um, for high-risk individuals and for young individuals where their breasts are very dense because they have a lot of breast tissue, uh, MRI really does add. And, and we have actually found that to be the case. And I showed you an MRI picture. Uh, MRIs are very good for looking at blood vessels. And abnormalities of blood vessels is one of the earliest changes that happen in breast cancer. PET, PET is, is an abbreviation for positron emission tomography. And, but it's, 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 a, it's a very, very sophisticated uh, test of uptake of a very sophisticated kind of radio, radioisotopic kind of material. Um, and what, wh where the advantage of PET is that it gives you some sense of the activity of the cells. So that uh, you can have a lump and it could be dark on a mammogram and it could have an abnormal blood vessel in it, but it could be totally quiescent and not using glucose and not dividing. And then the PET scan would be negative. But the problem with PET right now is that you need a fairly large lump to be able to see it well on a PET scan. It's called a resolution issue, whereas both MRIs and, uh, and mammograms have great resolution and can see very tiny things. So we're not quite there yet. Um, it is a very active area of research, and I think it should be a more active area of research, better imaging tools for, for the breast. Um, there are a couple of really exciting ones. There's, there's, um, uh, there is a, a way of using mammography and actually getting slices in the breast the same way a CAT scan does. It's called tomosynthesis. And we've seen some data on that that looks profoundly exciting. And we actually sent a team to, to France to actually look at a machine that we may import here and study here to actually look at that, uh, at that uh, particular tool. Um, uh, there's also something called MR spectroscopy, which is something like a PET scan because not only can you, it's like magnetic resonance imaging, but you could also s actually image molecules that are either up or down. All right, and, and that also can give further information. So that this is really a very exciting area of, of, of investigation. The other exciting area of investigation is what was mentioned before, is actually seeing if we could find abnormal cancer cells before they even have a, even a small enough collection that we could see them by looking at things in the blood, such as circulating tumor cells, but more than that, abnormal pieces of DNA, for example. Uh, where we can actually uh, find the DNA in the blood, analyze it, and see if there are any of those gene abnormalities that may be associated. Uh, this is obviously could be a tough area because we might be able to do a blood test and say, you have cancer somewhere in your body and I can't tell you where. That's not good. So that we've got to tie that together with better imaging tools. But these are also very active areas of investigation. We need a ton more research, you know? I mean, all right, I'm going to do my politics and then I won't say it anymore, all right? Americans spend 11 times more on soft drinks than all cancer research combined. All right? All right? You put it all together from all sources, you know, government, industry, philanthropy, all sources, all cancers, we spend 11 times more on soft drinks in the United States. All right? And I'm not even going to talk about bank bailouts. All right? All right? I mean, because I, 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 you know, the numbers are just staggering in, the, in that regard. All of cancer research in the United States is 11, 11, 11 and a half billion dollars a year, period. You know, compare that to, you know, AIG has sucked up how many years of, um, of, uh, you know, of cancer research. So whether that's right or wrong, I'm not going to get into it. I'm not an expert in that. I'm just saying is that, is that you know, considering the magnitude of the cancer problem, considering that half of all men will get cancer and a third of all women will get cancer, and, 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 and roughly a quarter or a third of all deaths are due to cancer, 
the, the, considering the magnitude of the problem, what as a nation or as a world we, we want to spend on solving it is just ridiculous. And uh, we can make much more advances much more quickly. All of cancer research from all sources, 11 to 11 and a half billion per year. All right, uh, soft drink market is 68 billion. Tobacco advertising, tobacco advertising budget, 17 billion. All right, and I can go on and on, you know, in terms of comparison. So, so just, just keep this in mind, you know, is that, you know, the, the stimulus plan is helpful, but it's gonna increase the National Cancer Institute budget by about 15%, that's about all. It's not gonna double it, not gonna triple it, about 15%. So, I won't say anything more about politics, but all of us who are passionate about the cancer problem have to be aware of this and have to work really hard to make sure that that, that, and the research should not be just clinical research. We need a lot of basic research. We need imaging research. We need Im research in all areas. We've got a lot of smart people doing a lot of hard work with a lot of dedication. We're just grossly underfunded. Okay, I won't talk politics anymore. Yes, please. Hi, thank you so much. I noticed in your um, biography um, that you're working with the concept of dose density. Uh, dose density mostly applies to chemotherapy and now applies to um, uh, the targeted therapies that we're developing, things like Herceptin, for example, and new targeted therapies to, for, for cancer. And basically, it is a, um, you know, it's worth a whole separate lecture, frankly, all right, is, uh, is that, uh, that cancers don't grow wild and crazy. Cancers, like every other tissue in the body, follow certain rules of growth. And the fundamental rule of growth of normal and abnormal things was discovered by somebody named Benjamin Gompertz in 1825 uh, in London. Uh, and it's called a Gompertzian curve. And, it's a, it's, and, and, and frankly, this self-seeding hypothesis that I presented earlier is the first, in my mind, the first reasonable explanation for why things grow along that pattern. But being that that's the pattern of growth of cancers, we've used that to plan our therapy. And what we have uh, hypothesized and then proven with a lot of experiments, in, including in laboratory and in the clinic for a long time at this point, is that it, when you treat cancer, it's more important to treat it often than to treat it at high dose. So that we used to give chemotherapy, or some used to give chemotherapy an extremely high dose and have to do bone marrow replacement. You might have heard about bone marrow transplants. And that was clearly shown not to be very, very helpful. Um, and frankly, you don't have to use high dose of things, but you have to treat at the right interval. And right now, we're doing a lot of very re research that I'm very excited about, at least. I was going to call it exciting research, but that's a value judgment. Research that I am excited by of looking at some very, very new drugs, brand new drugs, and picking the schedule of the drugs so that it's optimal for those drugs. And one of the things that we're finding in that regard is that intermittent exposure is actually not only safer and better tolerated for many drugs, but actually more effective. So that we, we, we are actually, and I wrote a paper a couple years back that you can find uh, you know, in, in the literature about designing more effective and less toxic therapies by the use of these particular principles. So this is a very active area of research, and beyond that, I'd have to go into, into, into specifics. But a lot of the research in this building and the new, the, the new, the new buildings that we have for, um, for research you know, you know, across the way uh, are, are, are focusing on basic science understanding of cancer that could be interpreted in ways uh, that we can use mathematics to use that basic science to, desi to design optimal treatments. The math part is important. You, know, you, you, know, you, 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 just, you can understand that what gravity is by dropping an apple, but to build an airplane, you have to need engineering, which needs math. And we haven't had enough math in cancer biology or in any biology to the present day, and that's something that many of us are working on. OK. I think there's a whole flurry of hands down here. So, Oh, there you are. OK. OK. There's obviously a whole, yeah, we're, okay. I, um, I don't control could, the mic. Thank could goodness. you say something about the um, nutritional and environmental possibilities of uh, preventing cancer? Okay. Where, things that you're looking into at the moment. Yeah, nutrition and cancer. Well, actually, it's a, it's a pretty active area of, of, uh, you know, of investigation. The one thing that we could say absolutely for sure, definitively without any question, is it's not good to be fat, okay? Fat in your body is very bad for you. Not just breast cancer, but we're talking about colon cancer, we're talking about prostate cancer in men, is that anything in your diet that is actually causing obesity is going to, is going to be bad for you. There's lots of reasons why fat in your body is not good for you. Um, and it's not just the fact that in females, particularly fat makes estrogen, which is because in fact, uh, the association between, um, between fat in your body and cancer is even more with estrogen receptor negative breast cancer than with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. 
It may be, and this is one of the current areas of research, is that fat tissue promotes inflammatory response. Inflammatory, inflammation is your body's response to infection. That's what, that's what it is. And, um, and that fat tissue actually promotes nonspecific stimulation of your immune system. This is going to be a shocker to everybody in this audience who hasn't heard me say this yet, uh, many of you had, is that immune stimulation, nonspecific general immune stimulation, promotes cancer growth. All right, that there is a marketing push out there to say your immune system is your best friend, stimulate your immune system, it'll kill your cancer cells and not to worry. This is a marketing tool. This is not based on science. Everything that we know now about the role of the, the immune system in cancer suggests that stimulation of the immune system nonspecifically is actually bad for you. Uh, every breast with breast cancer is in, the, in it has evidence of, of white cells in an inflammatory response. Every prostate with, with cancer in it has inflammatory response, in other words, white cells that look like they're fighting infection. We know in the laboratory unequivocally that white cells coming from your bone marrow are critical for cancer cells to be able to seed, what I showed you earlier as well. So I am very concerned about things in health food stores that are immune stimulants, because they may be the worst thing you could possibly do is nonspecific immune stimulation. They do work. They do cause nonspecific stimulation of the immune system to a low degree. But a low stimulation for a long time may be very bad for you. So I'm, I'm encouraging you sort of not to do that. Now, in terms of what to eat, the only thing that we know, the only nutritional supplement that we have any really good data on is vitamin D. All right? And vitamin D story gets more and more interesting and exciting as more and more data is released. The biology is really very simple, okay? Everybody in this room can trace their ancestry to a few thousand people who walked out of Central Africa into Yemen about 80,000 years ago. And those people walked into Yemen and then they spread throughout the world. The current thinking is they traveled along the coast, settled in South India, and then eventually, you know, because of climate change, moved into North India and into Afghanistan, eventually into Europe, eventually into, into, into Asia. Uh, over this last 80,000 years and populated. We are genetically almost identical. We are so homogeneous, people throughout the world. You actually can find people in Africa that are, that, that are genetically somewhat different, uh, but, and not many, because most really could also derive the ancestry from Central Africa. But that everybody outside of Africa, basically, is, is so close genetically. We, we, are, we are the most homogeneous species that's known. Any two pigeons on the street of New York are different, more different genetically than any two humans drawn at random from anywhere in the world. All right? that's, 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 how, that's how similar we are. And, um, and, and, so, and so that is a, uh, you know, that is, uh, you know, a, very, a very important factor in understanding, really, that homogeneity. How did I get started on this? Huh? Vitamin D. Okay. <laughs> So what is, the characteristic of, what is the characteristic of Central Africa? It's hot, and there's lots of sun, all right? And our skin was dark when we lived there, right? And as we started moving more into Northern Europe and Northern Asia, all right, over many, many generations, we got lighter skin. Why? Because it's cold, we wear clothes, and because there isn't that much sunshine. So we need the lighter skin to absorb more sunlight to make more vitamin D. So what do we do? We cover ourselves up, we put on sunblock, and we live indoors most of the time. So vitamin D deprivation is, is the standard. And frankly, I think that even what we consider the normal range of vitamin D levels may be too narrow at, at the low end. But, you know, so you should have a vitamin D level that I think at the high end of the normal range. Most people have vitamin D levels at the low end of the normal range or, or below that, really, in the abnormal range when it's actually, when it's actually measured. Most people require, now there's two ways to get vitamin D. You can do sunbathing, I don't recommend it. Skin cancer, wrinkles, you know, um, you know, nude sunbathing in New York City can cause other problems. So I don't recommend that. And so supplementation of vitamin D makes sense. And most people need about 2,000 international units a day of vitamin D3, all the pens come out, uh, 2,000 international units per day of vitamin D3 to get into the right range. Some people need more. Some people do well with less. It's very easy. You take 2,000 a day, or you can also take 10,000 once a week. You can actually buy on the internet uh, the good supplies of capsules. I do that. I take 10,000 once a week because I can't remember to take a pill every day. And so that, the, um, uh, and that gets you, uh, gets you, into, in, you know, into the good range. And you should periodically have your vitamin D level checked. 
Other than that, there is no known vitamin supplementation for cancer that's actually good for you. And an overview published in The Lancet a few years back looked at all the randomized trials of vitamin supplementation in the world, including famous trials of beta carotene and vitamin A and other things, and universally, selenium, vitamin E, universally, vitamin supplementation actually caused the opposite of what people were trying to do. More lung cancer, more prostate cancer, you know, shorter survival. So, so vitamin supplementation other than D is not a good idea. Now, you would say calcium. It's a good idea to take calcium. The jury's out, but it doesn't hurt you to take like an extra 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day. Uh, but most people probably are getting enough in their diet, so you don't want to push that. Beyond that, you know, eating specific things, you know, eat blueberries and you won't die, that kind of stuff, all right, is not based on real science. It's not based on the kinds of hard-nosed, randomized trial science that, 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 that I would recommend. And the very best book that I've ever read about nutrition is by a, a very good writer named Michael Pollan, and it's called In Defense of Food. And he makes the claim that you should eat food and not the term that I used before, artificial food-like substances. Like, you know, you know, you know if the list of, of if, if the first ingredient is sugar and then there's 40 chemicals after that, you know that that's not food. Um, and, that, uh, and that you should eat it in its, close, its, its most natural form possible, mostly plants. He's not saying no meat, but mostly plants, all right? And obviously don't eat too much. Um, and, uh, you know, I recommend that reading to everybody, really. In Defense of Food, Michael Pollan. And that would really, it's, it's a very common sense approach toward, uh, toward diet. Again, too, you know, read the book. You'll see the whole notion of micronutrients. You know, if you eat any one particular thing, it's going to have protective action. There's not a bit of science to support any of that. So, you know, it's, it's a, um, you know, I know flax, these seeds are sometimes used as flavorings and certain things in small amounts. But I'm very worried about things that are found in diets, normal diets, in small amounts, all of a sudden consumed in large amounts. Um, you know, and soybeans is a very good example. You know, you can really overdose on, on soybeans, you know, on, 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 on the kinds of uh, what they call phytoestrogens that occur in soybeans and other things. And I actually, I, I actually had a patient who um, was, was eating so much tofu, okay, that when I spoke to her and she actually stopped, she actually had breakthrough bleeding. She actually had vaginal bleeding, that she was so stimulating her uterus with the phytoestrogens in, in the tofu that she, was had, that she had increased endometrial thickness. So that's, I mean, that's an extreme case, and there was a lot of tofu. But that, the, um, uh, but that, actually, that actually can occur. So, so we need a commonsensical approach. Two more questions. Two more. Make them good. Make them hard. Huh? We'll do one on that side, and then we'll do one on this side, yes? Okay, you, you're all set? Okay, Thank please. Thank you. Your thoughts, doctor, on estrogen therapy for metastatic breast cancer, uh, estrogen positive, that's become resistant to right. drugs well, yeah, over yeah, the course of years. Okay, well, you mean the use of estrogen itself as, as a therapy? All right. yeah. um, well, first of all, if you have a cancer cell that is sent, that requires estrogen, the very first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to deprive that cancer cell of estrogen. In the postmenopausal situation, there's two ways of doing that. Because remember, your ovaries are not making estrogen anymore. Uh, but you still have estrogen in your body because it's being made by your normal tissues. So tamoxifen is a molecule that's very much like estrogen and attaches to the estrogen receptor. So it, it stops the estrogen from attaching. And it also stimulates the cell to die rather than to divide. And that's a very good drug. Uh, in the postmenopausal years, it's largely been replaced by another class of drugs called aromatase inhibitors. Now, aromatase is an enzyme that's found throughout the body, okay? And, um, you know, I could ask my trick question, who has more estrogen in her breast, an 18-year-old or an 81-year-old? And those of you who have heard me before know that it's the same. And how could that be? Where does the 81-year-old get estrogen in her breast? She gets it from aromatase. Aromatase is making estrogen in the breast. Uh, in the premenopausal patient who has a lot of estrogen coming from her uh, ovaries, um, she doesn't have to make estrogen in her breast, and so aromatase levels are low. You take away the ovary function because the ovaries you know, decrease in their ability to make estrogen as you get older, and now the aromatase levels go up in the breast, and the breast makes its own estrogen. So you can block that enzyme, that aromatase, with inhibitors. There's three of them. They're all good drugs. Some people tolerate one better than the other. You may have to switch around a little bit to find one that doesn't cause muscle aches and pains, but they're very, very good drugs. But let's say you have an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer that um, is, you know, the tamoxifen maybe worked for a while and then stopped working, and then aromatase inhibitors worked for a while and then they stopped working. There is 
there is research going on and actually using estrogen to treat such, such situations. It's not standard of care yet. It's a research question. It's a research tool. But, but we have found that with prolonged periods of estrogen deprivation, that some cells actually become hypersensitive to estrogen. And when you re-treat them with estrogen, that they, then, that they then can die also. So that there's, there's some very good research projects going on there, too. And so if you're going to take that approach and you're on a legitimate quality research project, I think that that would be a very good thing to do. But I would never do it outside of a research setting because it has to be followed very carefully and has to be looked at. There are people now who are looking at alternating things like tamoxifen with estrogen or alternating tamoxifen with an aromatase inhibitor. And remember, it got to the, I gave an answer before that intermittent therapy may be actually better than continuous therapy for certain situations. So I myself am fascinated by that approach, and I think that's something that we are, are talking very seriously about studying in a, in a variety of situations. I think last question. Yes? Somebody have the mic? OK. Hi, can you talk a little bit about what type of research is being done to find additional inherited breast cancer genes? Yeah, well, actually an excellent question and a very good exit question because it gets into you know, lots of areas. Um, first of all, the, the biggest risk factor for breast cancer is being a woman. The second biggest risk factor for breast cancer is being older. Um, however, that you can inherit from your mother or your father an abnormality in your normal genes, all right, that, you know, the genes that we show ourselves, that could predispose you to the development of certain cancers like breast cancer and ovarian cancer. The two big ones are BRCA1 and BRCA2. These are normal genes. We all have them. We all have them in all of our cells. But you can inherit an abnormal BRCA1 or an abnormal BRCA2 from your mother or your father. And if you do that, your chance of getting breast cancer or ovarian cancer can be extremely high. Men with BRCA2 abnormalities can have breast cancer, can have prostate cancer, um, uh, and maybe even other cancers may be increased in the situation. And we have very good, now if you have a family history of breast cancer, and it's important to know your family history, uh, it may be very important for you to know what your genetic abnormalities are, or if you have them or not, for guiding therapeutic decisions, but also for advising other members of your family, or even prevention strategies, uh, of which you know, there are many, including surgical removal of the organs that may turn into cancer if that seems to be appropriate. These are very highly individual decisions and you know, they, they have to be weighed carefully and it takes a long time in discussion. However, there are other genes that you, can, that you can inherit that are not abnormal but still can give you a higher incidence of breast cancer. And what I, we call these polymorphisms. Polymorphism means many shapes, right? So that uh, we mentioned noses before. Each of us has a different shaped nose, right? They're all normal noses, but they all look slightly different. Similarly, you can have a normal gene, and each of our genes can be slightly different than other genes. And have some small changes. They still function normally. They still do what they're supposed to do. But they're a little bit different. And it may be that these genes in some individuals may be different enough that they may be able to predispose. And, and we call these low penetrance genes because something like BRCA1 or BRCA2 abnormalities can increase your chance of getting breast cancer 11-fold, for example. These genes may increase your chances of getting breast cancer by a factor of, let's say, 1.6. Well, a 60% increase is still a lot, obviously, and it's still important, but it's not as big. And, and there have been some that have already been discovered. There are more that are being discovered. Um, we've gotten to the point where, where to really find these, we have to look at extremely large numbers of people in the tens of thousands. And so uh, various cons consortia of investigators are banding together to pool all of their data and all of their families or information to try to find these so that we can actually have profiles that can be useful for guiding individual people. There are some commercially available tests out there now, but most of us feel that these tests really aren't ready for prime time, that they're giving information that is not really accurate or we don't know it's accurate. And so people may make bad decisions on the basis of these, these genetic tests out there at the present time. They may turn out to be useful. And when they are useful, by all means, they, they should be used. But they're not quite ready yet. So there's a lot of research going on in this area. The most exciting thing to me about this research is that if you have like a normal gene, but it's, 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 it's got a certain configuration that may increase your chance of getting breast cancer by, say, 30%. The question is why? What is, that, what is the RNA and the protein made by that gene that may actually have that? Because that's going to have that action, because that's going to give us information to understand where cancer comes from in the first place. And knowing that, then we can develop interventions, which may be diet, maybe lifestyle, maybe medications, maybe vaccines 
that can interfere with that action so that we can basically stop cancer before it actually happens. And that's the ultimate goal of what we're trying to achieve. All right, our time is up, folks. You've been wonderful. Thank you all very much.